Everybody ready? Okay. Keys. Okay. Great. <coughs> it's uh totally asleep 30 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Still partially asleep. So um so last time what did we talk about? Last time we talked about how um how we can do a two-tone measurement and I uh, get information on one quadrature and put all the force noise into the other quadrature, right? That's this back action stuff. Now with two tones as well, you can you can look at um, you can do a careful comparison of the rates of scattering of up conversion and down conversion. And if you if you're if you're following this literature in the field, there's um, there's a, a series of papers from a number of groups called they call it motional sideband asymmetry. Let me just remind you what that is. So, so here's in frequency space what's so there's the electrical resonator. I don't make a R here. So that's at five gigahertz. And then I can place a pump wherever I like, right? And then down here at thousand times lower frequency is the mechanical frequency, five megahertz. And the point is, is that I can look at this, the rate of scattering up and the rate of scattering down. Okay? And last time we went through this kind of this simple picture that if I take a photon, let's say that was on the red side, this pump is on the red side, I can absorb a mechanical quantum and get a higher frequency photon, and that's this side band right here. And this side band is loved by everybody because this is the one where you cool the mechanics. Right? So you keep on sucking up mechanical quanta, you cool it, you get the ground state. These sorts of things. So it's obvious as well that that, uh, that that rate that rate has to go to zero. If the mechanics is in the ground state here, that rate has to go to zero because you can't absorb anything anymore. You're done. You're, you hit the bottom. There's no one below you. <clears throat> Blue side, if I am sitting in the ground state, I can always go up. So the always to go up is this plus one. Okay, so the usual story that people say, which is, you know, which is true and accurate, is, is that this is a result of the quantization of the levels in the mechanical structure, and if you, once you're in the ground state, um, you know, there's nothing below, and that's, that's, that's why you get this asymmetry. So, the, the real question here, the bigger question, is what experiment do you do to show that the mechanical device obeys quantum mechanics. That's really what you're trying, that's the bigger over question. Does the cooling experiment, cooling to the ground state, show that the mechanical device is quantum? Does it? Any answers on that? So if you, if you, if I, you know, if I apply the red cooling and I cool down, and then I, I, I get, a, <coughs> there's a little peak that's a cold mechanical peak, and eventually it just disappears and disappears and disappears. Is that telling me anything about the quantum mechanics of the mechanical structure? It doesn't. Classical oscillator would look pretty much the same. Um, so with the cooling experiments, all these quantum ground state cooling stuff, there's no evidence of quantum mechanics in any of those experiments, even though the nature titles and science titles all have the word quantum in there. Right? So, so what experiment do you do to show that the mechanical device is quantized? <clears throat> okay, so uh, there's the, there's a history of these experiments. So Weinlin had a trapped ion and in a, you know, mechanic, it was vibrating mechanically in a trap, and they could do this kind of uh, side band cooling with that. And there's a PRL from PRL. There's a PRL from the 80s, late 80s, where they see the difference between up and down conversion and see the plus one. And the point of their paper is to say plus one means the wave-like nature of the mechanical ion, the mechanical motion of the ion. So in the history of this field of optical mechanics, people got to the point where you're in a low enough occupation that you can start to see the difference between Z and N plus one. And they write papers, we also see the wave-like nature of our mechanical system. But the experimental details are quite different. There's a difference in detection. So let me, so let me say something as well that can hopefully will uh, provide, once we get to the answer, provide some uh, uh, how, how I've, I've come to think about it after about a year of, of uh, thinking of these things. So, when you think of the wave-like nature of a mechanical system, the fact that it acts as a wave is where the quantization of the levels come from, right? So that's that's where you know the fact that I have a Gaussian, you know, little wave here, and then I have a 
one with a node here. The level quantization is by putting waves into this funny potential and then get quantization. Okay, so the fact that the levels are there is telling you about the wave-like nature. Let me tell you as well about um, this, this uh, a picture of noise. So there's a, there's a picture of noise called, you know, people call it quantum noise. And I didn't quite understand it when people like Osh Clerk and Steve Gervin were talking about it uh, 10 years ago in writing papers, you know, quantum noise and all this kind of thing. And the, the point of quantum noise, as opposed to classical noise, is that quantum noise takes into account the difference between absorption and emission, right? And so the, fre the, fre the noise at different frequencies, at positive frequency and negative frequency, one side is telling you, positive frequency is telling you about absorption, and the negative frequency is telling you about emission. Okay? And so the, the point is, is that the, if I look at the noise of the mechanical device, the noise is going to have asymmetric frequency. The, noise, the, spectral, the spectral density of the position noise is going to be asymmetric once I get down to the quantum limit. And the point is, is that one side of the noise will go to zero, and the other side of the noise will not. You can always emit, you, can't, you, can, always, you can always put a quantum into the mechanics, but you can't uh, emit it. Okay, so I'm just going to say those words, and then you'll see how where they become relevant as we get along here. So anyway, so we did, the, we did the experiment as well, where you can look for the, the asymmetry. And, you know, here's the cavity. Um, we apply a tone on the red side and up convert into the cavity at this peak. And we apply a tone on the blue side and down convert into this peak. And we don't overlap them to do BAE. We actually just keep them separated by a few line widths. So we can see both. And then we also apply a red tone here. This purple one is where we can cool and control the occupation of the mechanics. So here's some examples of the data that, that comes out where, you know, for different occupation factors in mechanics, different amount of cooling on the purple, I can see these two traces and they're clearly different. Okay. Oops. So they're clearly different. And then there's, you know, the microcircuit to make those measurements is, is more or less straightforward. There's nothing, nothing fancy there. Okay, so one critical thing for the experiments is actually balancing the power so that the rates of up conversion, they're always proportional to the amount of power you apply. So you better get the, the power right. And we do that by looking at the damping rate on the mechanical device as we increase the red power, as we increase the blue power. You can start to see the mechanical device get broadened and then narrow. So this is telling you how, much, how many photons are in the cavity, right? You can clearly see if I increase, increase the photons on the blue side, that I get narrowing, right? And I do that in the presence of red so that I don't get an unstable system, but I can look at the slope here and tell me how much power per, how much line width change. That's going to help me calibrate. So we believe that we understand the, the microwave power balancing to less than a percent in these so, kind of so devices. So this, this, this bottom uh, right curve, the two here, they were done with both side bands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you put you put up both side bands, and then I increment the red one a little bit, and I watch it broaden. Okay. And then I go to the to the blue one, and I can increment that one, so I can see it narrow. And so but if I look, you, you, you don't need to have both actually at the same time. You don't, you don't. But the problem with blue is that oh, it, yeah. the mechanical device is so narrow okay. that we, you you go ten hertz, and then you're unstable. Okay. So the natural mechanical line okay. is ten. Hertz. So why not broaden to a kilohertz here, and then I can take it down by hundreds of hertz and really see this line. Okay. It's just a matter of careful calibration. This was the calibration that you get for the thermal noise and showing you know, the transmission on either side of the circuit is slightly different. Anyway, this is a matter of calibrating the power. But it's a question, if you, were, if you gave the, got this paper as a reviewer, or you were doing this kind of measurement yourself, the question you'd be asking, well, how do I balance these powers? And you can do that by looking at the rate. The mechanical device is telling you about the local microwave power inside of it. OK, so you can look at the, the area of the blue one and the area of the red side band that's, that's appeared. You can take the ratio. You can plot that versus uh, the bottom, the, the, the red one. And the point is, is that if the cavity were in the ground state, if I didn't have any microwave occupation of the cavity, so meaning I don't have squashing and, and anti-squashing. 
if they don't have any squash or any squash, then this, this equation just is 1 plus uh, 1 plus 1 over nm, which is so that's just nm. Can can you can't see, uh, can't see that. that. Okay, let's get rid of that. My lab is filled with markers that no one can read. I don't know why the students would want to keep around. Okay, so 1 plus 1 over m, if you let the cathy be, go down to the ground state, which is just nm plus 1 over 1, right? So, or sorry, nm plus 1 over nm. So that's the, the, uh, the blue side band over the red side band. So that's what you'd expect uh, if the cathy were not occupied. But we have to deal with the fact that there's a really tiny amount of, you know, some microwave power in the cavity due to noise. We have to take that into account. Anyway, the, the point is, is that you can, um, you can see exactly what you'd expect. You go through the input-output theory, you can deal with the cavity noise, you can deal with a little bit of photons coming from the red side. We had a red a hot circulator that provided a, about a few tenths of a quantum from one side. And you can actually see exactly what you'd expect in the, the, the curves here. These are all the, the, the essentially the predictions from this N, uh, NM plus one effect. Okay. So, the data just works out perfectly, meaning like the stuff you measure, you do it carefully, you actually uh, see the plus one that you're expecting. It's a little more complicated than plus one due to all these other noises, but you can you can understand it. Okay, so so that's cool. So yeah, the students, you can see the plus one really clearly. Then the question is, is well, what does it mean? So um, this is where we worked really closely with with Osh Clerk, and there was some discussion this morning at a breakfast table about uh, theories to work with experiments. And um, there's you know, Osh is, has provided uh, enormous amounts of, uh, of uh, uh, a benefit to these ex all, all of our experiments in the last few years. And um, you know, we would have much less uh, interesting things to say without his contribution to all this. So the issue here is this: is in the output of the experiment, there's this. You know, we have a optical system, and there's some a channel coming out, and then we detect on that channel coming out. But what do we detect? Um, in the Wineland experiment, it's more like <coughs> photo detection, meaning you gather up photons and you just count them. In our experiment, we don't do photo detection. We do linear detection of the microwave field coming out. And so we have a linear amplifier that's on the output field. And linear amplification and linear amplifiers are different than photo detectors, right? Their properties are different. Linear amplifier is required to eject noise back into the circuit of at least the minimum amount. Okay, and there's a quantum limit to the back action of the linear amplifier. Photo detection, I can just grab the photons, they, they annihilate into my detector, and there's nothing coming backwards. So anyway, so this, this, is, this is the input-output theory results that you would get for photo detection. And what we wanted to try to do, just to give you the perspective, was to understand where the plus one came from. Does the plus one come from the quantum mechanics of the mechanical device, as the Wineland paper would say, or does the plus one come from the quantum mechanics of the electromagnetic field, which is not a very glorious result. We all know that the electromagnetic field is quantized, or at this point in history. So the way that we trace this through is that in the input-output theory, we actually, for the commutators, for um, for the mechanical and the electrical field, this is the commutator for the mechanical field and we put, instead of just having a delta function here, we put a variable beta. And so then we can trace beta through the equations and see where it comes out, right? This is like a little, put a little sticker on it and just watch it come through. And we did the same with the electromagnetic field. We put an alpha there and just watched it come through. And so these are the different spectral densities that you'd expect on the red side and on the, on the blue side of okay? Now, the equation's a little complicated because, because it comes right out of our paper which deals with some non-idealities. So um, some of the non-idealities are there's some extra red power in the hot circulator. So that, in reality, in, in ideal case, you don't have to consider that. The cavity's in the ground state. There's no red power, so we don't have to consider that. This is a Lorentzian. This is the actual little mechanical peak. That's this prefactor here. And then, then the prefact that mechanical peak should be proportional to the mechanical quanta. Right? We're, we're good with that. And then the, we can figure out the red side here. This is just a little tenth of a quanta that we had to take account of. Um, minus uh, the cavity occupation here. So twice that. 
So if the cavity is in the ground state, this peak is just proportional to NM. If it's not in the ground state, then this is actually squashing. This is the red heating into the noise of the cavity. But you know, if you don't want to think about squashing, just think of the cavity in the ground state. So on the red side, the upconverted peak is just proportional to NM. That means it goes to zero when you're in the ground state. Other side, if you pump on the blue side, I get the same factors. I'll, I'll ignore all the non-ideal cases here. This stuff can all be zero. And I get NM plus beta. Beta is the commutator of the mechanics. <coughs> so this is saying that on the blue side, it's NM plus one, and the one's coming from the mechanics. So if you do photo detection on the output side, you are seeing the fact that the mechanical commutator is the quantum one and not a classical thing. So that's good. So that's so, so we don't have to send a note to Wyman saying it's hey, wrong. Uh, I'm not sure that would be good, good for my career. But anyway, so on the amplitude detection. So now you're not measuring the, uh, the what's just absorbing into your detector. You're, you're, you're measuring what's, what's going to the linear amplitude in, the, in, the, in what's in the output field. So I'm putting a linear amplifier on there. And the point is this, is that the output spectra have a different, different formula, okay? Now you still see the plus one, so let's just look at it here. So you see NM plus, now beta over two, and that appears on both sides. So the mechanical occupation plus the uh, zero point fluctuations appear on both sides. Then I have the squashing term, we can forget that. We have little power on the red side from a hot circuit here, we forget that. And then we can't get rid of this minus alpha over 2 plus alpha over 2. Okay. And again, the alpha came from the amplifier. So here's the, here's the, and so you can see as well that the alpha is on this side as well. So the output spectra for both sides, you, you have amplifier noise, that's the alpha. And then I have beta over 2 minus alpha over 2, beta over 2 plus alpha 2. So these two cases here, so in this, in this, um, in this, in this uh, bottom case, I have shot noise in the field, and then I have, it actually reinforces with the, um, hang on, I'm not saying this right. <clears throat> right, so I have, so this is the, this is the alpha, that's the amplifier noise, that's this part here. And then I have the fluctuations of the mechanics, which is both of these here, X and SX. And then I have essentially squashing, which is the alpha over two here. So the point is, is that the amplifier injects noise into the circuit, excites it, and the mechanical device eats a hole into that noise on the red side. But the mechanical device adds to it on the blue side. And that's the, just the squashing and anti-squashing of the quantum <coughs> noise of the amplifier. So I think you said something about quantum noise being uh, is it safe to say that that's frequency dependent, quantum noise? Is that what you were trying to say? Yeah, it's frequency dependent, but quantum noise, the point is, is that the plus and minus frequencies are different. And it has to do with the difference between emission and absorption. And in quantum mechanics, you have to deal with the difference in emission and absorption because you have situations like in the simple harmonic oscillator where even the ground state you can't go lower. And is that what you're saying there, that off-center, or the eating in, eating into the noise? Is that, is that what you're saying there? Yeah, so um, what I'm, let's see, I'm trying to, let me wake me up here. What I'm trying to say is that um, there's a, there's an, there's noise coming from the amplifier that the mechanical device responds to, and the phase of the response is such that it eats a hole on the red side. That's squashing, like I mentioned before. It's squashing of the quantum noise of the circuit. The amplifier excites the circuit. And when, you know, and it's ex it actually excites it exactly to h bar omega over 2 in this kind of input output theory. And the point is, is that the mechanical device responds to that h bar omega over 2 of excitation in the electrical circuit and, and actually produces motion in the mechanics that then, then up converts and then it eats a hole into the noise. This is just the same squashing physics when the electrical circuit was excited. But at this point, we're down to the h bar omega over 2 in that circuit. So the point is that the mechanical device responds to the uncertainty principle in the circuit and actually then produces motion, and that motion is correlated with the, with the electrical circuit. And on the red side, the blue side, the correlation flips sign, 
and you end up with a, a hole on either side, or a hole on one side, it eats a hole, and then it adds to it. But so when you add in the zero point fluctuations on top of this, this is the electrical circuit, the circuit fluctuations, this is the mechanical fluctuations. When I add the two together, this exactly backfills that hole, and this adds to it, and I get a plus one. So the uncertainty principle of fluctuations in mechanics filled in exactly the hole that was eaten into the quantum noise of the circuit through the correlations with mechanics, you know, just the coherent correlations. This backfills that, and this adds together, and I get a plus one. And the point is that in the uh, in the circuit in the equations that come out, nm plus a half from the mechanics, <coughs> this essentially this appears on both sides of the of the of the of the, of the noise spectrum. So meaning that the mechanical fluctuations and the uncertainty principle fluctuations are essentially adding on both are on both sides symmetrically, and I can't see the difference between going up or going down in the mechanics with this here. So some people might say, well, you know, the fact that this hole filled in exactly is only true if the uncertainty principle of mechanics is just right. And that is an accurate statement. But the point is, is like, are we seeing the wave-like nature? Are we seeing the fact that we can't go downwards in the mechanics? And the answer, I think the answer here is that it's not. It appears symmetrically on both spectra on either side. And this essentially is appearing like a classical fluctuation. So if you had a perverse universe where there was uh, classical, some sort of, the mechanical device was actually classical, but it was somehow connected to a thermal bath that kept it at h bar omega over 2. So meaning that you could go downwards in this, in this system, right? In quantum physics, I can't go downwards when I'm in the ground state because there's no level there. Classical physics, if I have a fluctuation and it's h bar omega over 2, if it's classical, I could keep going down, right? So what I'm saying is that in the photon detection case before, all the beta appeared on one side and it was asymmetric with the mechanical thermal fluctuations. But in the amplitude detection, the uncertainty principle of the mechanics appears symmetrical on both sides. So you have to be in a pretty perverse universe for the uh, mechanical fluctuations zero point to be just right and to be classical but also just the right amplitude. But let's say that you're dealing with a complete can I, can I say this? Son of a bitch. Like somebody who is like very, you know, uh, super, tech, super technical, super logical. What does the experiment say? I think the answer is, is that in the amplitude detection, you can't say that the mechanical device is quantum. You can say that it appears exactly with the right fluctuation amplitude, but it's not exactly, uh, you're not showing the fact that there's a difference between emission and absorption, and that's, the, that's telling you about the levels. So that's your quantum levels. So, actually, like two things I'd like to, to, to ask. The first one is that it's kind of interesting because if the optical field were classical, you would have no, no asymmetry, right? For this type of detection. Yeah, that's right. So, so if this commuted and these were these were right. these were zero, I would you know then you would have no asymmetry. I'd have no I'd have none of this. Right. And then I would just have zero point sitting on top of there. Right. That's it. Now the other thing is I was wondering. What is the physics of the plus minus on one side and plus plus on the other? Is, is it because really you should think that the polaritons and in, on, on one branch the polariton is a linear superposition of the mechanics and the optic with the plus sign and in the other end is it with the minus sign? I, you know, there may be a way of understanding it that way. Um, and there's probably a funny way to respond to that saying that, you know, you, you may understand it that way, but let me tell you why. Yeah. The way I understand it is that this is this is just this is squashing. Like for instance, look at so if you were wanting to know about squashing, you would have you would just be looking at this NC term, and you see how the NC term flips on. And so I could just I should just add this alpha over two with the occupation of the of the cavity, and I can see that that the the the, the sign flip here is the standard squashing we're talking about. Yeah, I was so wondering if it, so if it's an interference you, effect. It's, it's an interference, yeah. This is an interference between going around the loop, from going from electrical fluctuations producing mechanical motion that then gets upconverted back into electrical fluctuations and interferes. And the point is, is that the electrical circuit, I can add in the quantum fluctuations with the classical one and the flip sign just like the squashing and anti-squashing that we're all familiar with. So there's right. nothing special about quantum mechanics here. It's just more fluctuations than we thought. At each, add h prime over 2. You didn't, know, you didn't add that. In. You got the NC plus h prime over 2. So, this whole effect here that produces the asymmetry from one side, the sine flip, is squashing. It's squashing of the quantum noise. 
That's why squashing is kind of interesting, right? It's actually, it works all the way down to the uncertainty principle noise. And, uh, but then you have this situation where you've added in exactly the right amount of noise on either peak here to fill in the squashing and squashing peak. So you filled in this hole with exactly the right size, and then I added a two here. So I believe the interpretation of this means that the you can't say that the mechanical device is wave-like. You can say that you've observed the fluctuations of exactly h bar wave over two, but you really haven't shown the fact that the trace it all the way back to the fact that the levels are quantized in the mechanics. It's just some fluctuation that you're adding into it. But it's exactly the right size. So key. Yeah. So basically, if you pump your cavity, you're going to increase the That's what you're Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, right, because he just, that's right. And then you always have this fluctuation, the alpha over two, the h omega over two, you can't get rid of that. And then, if, then, but that is adding exactly with the GC. So if you put a strong coherent state in the cavity, the symmetry would become much bigger. Yeah, and you know, we, it, it's, it, it's actually in our data, because the cavity gets occupied as we, this, this, here was the asymmetry taken for different cavity occupations, just like you're saying. So here's for 2.3 quanta, here's a third of a quanta. Here the asymmetry is closer to what the quantum, you know, yeah, yeah. simple quantum picture would say. And then if you add in classical noise into the cavity, you get more squashing. <coughs> well, we've got, you know, led to all this because we have to deal with the cavity occupation. So then you start to see um, how the cavity occupation behaves. And you can see that the uncertainty principle in the cavity is just combining with the cavity occupation in a simple way. So anyway, this, this is why I would say that in photo detection, you actually isolate clearly the commutator for the mechanics, and that interpretation is correct, that you're seeing the wave-like nature of the mechanics. But in the linear detection, it's really just squashing of the uncertainty principle noise that's injected into the circuit the mechanics responds to and eats a hole or adds to it. So it's just, it's just mechanics. The asymmetry comes from that phase shift in, in just classical dynamics of the mechanics. Anyway, you can read our paper. There's a long PRX uh, that describes all this. Osh wrote a big theory section at the beginning. We then provided all the experiment section after that. Uh, question. So, if, if you know people in, in the sort of microwave uh, uh, low temperature circuit business have put a lot of effort into making like number state detectors yeah. and things like that. So would that be a way of circumventing these linear detector issues? Yeah, that, so in principle, yes. In practice, there's no, so when you actually look at our experiments and you see the amplitude of the pumps that are being applied and actually transmit through, that we would saturate any of the amplifiers that have been developed. Okay. So most of the microwave amplifiers that can count photons, they count photons, but then they saturate at one photon. They're like, good job. Yeah. <laughs> Mission. <laughs> Right? There's nothing that's like a uh, photo detector, like you buy from Thor Labs, where you can dump real power into it and then see the shot noise of the field. Nothing exists like that. And just, just you know, I think a, a really cool experiment that somebody should do, and we've kicked this around for a long time ago, you know, just finite bandwidth. Some sort of uh, uh, insulating crystal with some magnetic material, magnetic atoms in there, polarize those atoms, make a, a resonant absorber, and then do magnetometry to tell you how much microwave photons are coming in. That would be a photon detector for microwaves, right? Somebody should do that. <clears throat> okay, so let me tell you. Um, let's see. Let me tell you. Let me tell you about something else. Um, I'm about thirty minutes in, right? Yeah. Okay. Let, let's let's just switch gears. Let's let me, let me tell you about something else. <clears throat> let's tell you about something something that, that I think is new and fun and interesting, um, at least for me. So, so that you had a lot of problems on these magic detectors, and I think Marcus was also seeing some effects of things like non-Marcovian non fluctuations in many hands, right? So how, how do you think that would affect your kind of interpretation of these like magic detectors? Yeah, so, um, so what Makuna is mentioning is, is um, so for instance, not only do we see, um, not only do we see uh, mechanical, when we drive our system with microwaves, we see occupation of the cavity. It starts to get occupied, you know, a little bit at first, and then eventually a quanta or two, as you go to really high power. 
You can obviously see that, you can not only see heating of the mechanical structure, so the thermal bath that the mechanical device is attached to starts to get heated. We also see weird effects where, um, and we never don't know, this appears in some devices and, and not in others, where if we apply, go to the blue side, apply so much blue that we can get a, we can we can overcome the damping of the mechanical system, make it self-excited. And it just, you know, it becomes self-excited, the amplitude becomes huge. And then when we go back to the red side, um, the thermal bath that we're attached to, you know, the fridge, appears to be much hotter. And the fridge hasn't heated up, but somehow the local environment of the, of the mechanical structure becomes, becomes uh, heated. And it doesn't just cool down, you know, you'd expect thermal time constants that are really short for these small devices. We're talking about it stays hot and it kind of can become uh, burst noise. Like you see um, over, over the period of uh, maybe hours, you can see the mechanical device suddenly get hot and then cools back down and then it suddenly gets hot. So there's some other bath that we've stirred up that we're attached to and it's releasing heat in some funny way. And it's not, not necessarily that I'm moving. Oh no. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not a white noise. Exactly. It's, yeah, and it's not just like white noise I'm attached to it. It can be bursty. We didn't see we don't see that in every device. We see it often, <coughs> but we don't see it in every device. Uh, none of the data that we've taken here would would is affected by that, for sure. And um, you know, in pre, back at Cornell in those experiments when we were there, we, we would see this in spades in the really tiny wires. So, yeah, we're always on the lookout for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we do very long averages of our mechanical motion, but um, we always make sure we're making measurements where everything looks stationary. Everything looks stationary. But if you do, we do avoid applying a lot of blue power on the, on the blue <coughs> side and self-exciting it for these reasons. Okay, yeah, so here was the thought. Um, so when I, moved, when I moved to Caltech, you know, we were doing mechanical stuff for little mechanical things for a long time. Um, and I was trying to think, well, what could we do new? What could we do something that's interesting? Start something new. And, um, you know, I was thinking, well, what about trying to do something at centimeter scale? You know, trying to go to something <coughs> bigger. And, you know, because it looks like all the micron scale stuff is working. You know, we're down to the point of arguing over interpretation. You know, we see the zero point fluctuations, but now we're arguing whether or not it really is a quantum or not. I mean, whatever. It's like, yeah, it's, the quantum case is more or less working. But so, like, could we actually do something with a large object? And with when you think about all the things that we've discussed in a lot of optical mechanics, you you compare the optical rate, gamma optical, always against the mechanical damping rate. And good things happen when that ratio becomes big. You can cool. You know, you're starting to control the dynamics with the cavity as opposed to losing energy out into the thermal bath. So that's uh, dissipation <coughs> mechanics is kind of a key to picking a good system. Um, actually, yeah, okay, let me just show you this. So here are uh, quality factors of mechanical device, of mecha materials at, for kilohertz kinds of frequencies uh, measured at, at, at low temperatures. So, you know, here's, if you make if you take oxygen-free copper, high conductivity copper, you, it makes a pretty crappy mechanical <coughs> resonator around 100,000 for one kilohertz at, at 100 millicalories. And then, you know, fused silica isn't that great. Aluminum's looking better, you know, it gets almost a 10 to the 7. And niobium, there's two observations here in the uh, approaching 10 to the 8. And then you look at the other guys, you have quartz, silica, and sapphire. 10 to the 9. For the mechanical. So this is basically like you call given the geometry of a resonator? Or, uh, yeah, but, or you know, this was data taking in the in the early days of gravity wave detectors when people were trying to think of Weber bars and then what would be the right material to make a Weber bar out of. Um, What's a Weber bar? A Weber bar is so like is a is a is it, usually the configuration is a um, a two meter cylinder this diameter suspended in the center and is a gravity wave antenna solid gravity wave antenna. And so, it, so for instance, LIGO wasn't, and the interferometers were not the only choice. There was a split in the field of the two different detection techniques. One was massive mechanical devices, Weber bars. This by this guy, Joe Weber, who was at Maryland, who started doing those experiments. And eventually people, and there still is, I think, one or two running, where they have these large uh, one, two ton objects, cooled to 100 millikelvin, hanging off of a single copper strap and then with near uncertainty principle detection on the ends. 
and it's just a big a mechanical resonator. And so, you know, there were some other people who were looking at what are the different, you know, the different, um, um, the internal friction in the various materials. So the point is that you can get unbelievably great uh, mechanical quality factors out of uh, quartz silicon sapphire, right? Those, those are just incredible. Sapphire is particularly interesting in that it also has amazing microwave properties as well. You can build a Q of 10 to the 10 microwave resonator out of a little puck of sapphire. So sapphire is a, is a really good choice. We decided to do, that, that being said, we decided to work with superfluid helium for, other, for much other reasons, but somebody as well in the field should probably be messing around with hand-sized object of sapphire. On a fridge. I think it'd be really interesting. If we had a, enough bandwidth and, and people and stuff, that's that's what we'd do. Okay, so superfluid. So superfluid helium is a really interesting material. It has, a, if you're not aware of it, it has zero friction, just like a for motion, just like uh, electrons do uh, moving through a lattice when it's in a superconducting state. So it's a it's a macroscopic condensate. You you know you have just a bucket of it, and um, you know if you make rings of it. The fluid will go around the rings, and you come back tomorrow, and it's still flowing around the ring. Not only that, it actually has quantized motion, where if, as it goes around the ring, it only can go at discrete speeds. So you can think of it as a bicycle wheel that will only spin at discrete speeds. And you can see all this in the lab. Back when I was a grad student, I was working on superfluids, and you, we could make little rings, uh, centimeter size, and you could see quantization of the velocity field around that ring. So its other properties are interesting as well. It has very low speed of sound, so it's 10 times lower than normal materials. Most, most metals are 3,000, 4,000 meters a second. The speed of sound is tunable. It's really squishy material. So by one atmosphere of pressure, you can tune, um, you can change the density by, oh, oh man, I forgot this. It's one atmosphere to 1%. I think that's right. It's one atmosphere of pressure changes the density by 1%. But you can change the speed of sound by up to 50% before you get right before you get the solidification. So helium never becomes a, a, a solid as you cool it. It's the only material not to become a solid. But unless, until you get to 25 atmospheres, then it forms a HCP crystal. Okay. The density is very low as well. It's 10 times lower than most materials. My first uh, day at Berkeley in, in the low temperature group, I was told by the Seamus to go get a big doer of helium. It was a 100 liter doer. I grabbed the doer from the liquefier at Berkeley, and as I'm rattling it over, I'm like, 100 liters is 25 gallons. If this were water, that would be 200 pounds. This doer does not weigh 200 pounds. And I took it back, actually. I was just like, this is empty. <laughs> 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 it's, here's some weird stuff. It's chemically completely pure. It has uh, all the impurity atoms are frozen to the walls. And so when you have a, a sample of helium, it's helium. It's all helium. There's nothing else. And it's the only material that, that does that, right? So when people say silicon is the most pure material on the planet, they're unaware of helium, basically. It, not only is it uh, chemically pure, its isotopic purity is very high. So even stuff you get from the model is isotopically pure to a part of 10 to the 7. There's only one other isotope, helium-3, that's in the helium-4. And you can purify that even further. The best that's been gotten is 10 to the minus 14. We have a bottle of 10 to the minus 10 purity in the lab that we got from uh, Peter McClintock for about 4,000 bucks. It's a huge bottle, rich standard size bottle filled with 3,000 PSI, 10 to the 10 purity. So, Helium is very pure, chemically, isotopically, it's very pure as well. And if, if you actually go to the other direction where you add helium-3 in into it, eventually the helium-3 comes out of solution of the helium-4 and floats on top. It's the only material that naturally uh, isotopically purifies itself. Right? It's strange material. Um, below 2 Kelvin, it's where you get the superfluid and you start to have uh, frictionless motion. And at low temperatures, all the entropy resides essentially in the phonons. Right, in the acoustics of the squishy material. Now, up near higher temperatures, near Calvin, there's these other excitations called rotons. Nobody really knows what they are. But the phonons is just T to fourth. We, we don't understand that. OK, so not only does it have these properties, it also its microwave losses are expected to be unmeasurably low. And that's due to the fact that the atoms are complete 1s shell, 20 electrons or whatever it is, to the next excited state. It's a little unpolarizable, nearly a uh, little ball bearing. Right, that's the way to think of it. Um, yeah. 
Okay, so helium is interesting. And given the frictionless motion, that seems like a good place to start if you're worried about mechanical friction, right? <coughs> kind of a no-brainer. And why, why haven't we really been looking at this in the past? It starts to become an obvious choice for uh, optimal mechanical material, not a weird choice. It seems kind of obvious now. Okay, so acoustics. So we were going to look at the motion, and we're going to just look at a first sound wave, right? So sound in helium comes in varieties of different, different kinds of motion. Um, there's, the, there's just the ordinary sound, just the longitudinal uh, a density wave in the fluid. That's called first sound. And it turns out it does have some friction. It does have some loss. And it has to do with the fact that if I compress helium, the inner atomic potential is not linear. It becomes stiffer, like almost all materials do, as you press it. So the speed of sound changes as you compress it. That's a nonlinear uh, effect of a mechanical system. <coughs> and in your Hamiltonian describes all your phonon modes, that's going to couple <coughs> the modes together. So that means that if I have one uh, a sound mode, it can decay into others. Okay? It turns out whether or not that decay can happen from a three phonon process where you have one phonon decaying into two, or do I need to collide two phonons to produce two other ones? That's a four phonon process. And one of the interesting things is that in the history of this literature, all the way back from the 1950s through the 1970s, people were arguing like mad over, is it three phonon, is it four phonon? Russians were, it has to be a four phonon process. The Americans are like, well, the data says three phonon. You see t to the fourth, and so that agrees with the three phonon process. And there was this big battle. And it turned out that the, the thing that was interesting about all that was, can you guys see, see this here? Is that visible? No. no. Should I open the interview? Choose the black. Choose the black. Okay. Is in my pocket? No. It's on oh, the table. Yeah, there's. Sorry. So, excitations in an antimatter systems, people write dispersion relationship. So you have the energy. Um, you know, versus the momentum versus the k vector. And for superfluid helium, it's, it's linear, it looks linear at first, and then there's a roton minima, right? And um, this is the wave vector that you start to get to atomic size. So all this is low frequency sound down here, and then there's some excitation once you get to really short uh, wavelengths. The point is, is that uh, Landau said that it's obvious that the curvature of this the curvature of this initial dispersion has to have curvature like downward. If I'm going to hit a minimum here and then come down, or maximum and then come down, the curvature even at low has to be cupped like that. And if you have that curvature, you can't do three phonon process and conserve energy momentum. So he's like, three phonon can't work, it's got a four phonon, you should observe t to the sixth temperature dependence. People don't see that, they see t to the fourth. And ultimately, what's come to be understood is that the initial dispersion is actually curved the other way. So Landau was like, it has to be this other way. It's, most, it's probably the most obvious case. Turns out it's exactly opposite. And there's it's curved the other, other, other there's, direction. There's another way of doing it. Even in a completely linear dispersion relation, you can get this three phonon process. Can you? Yes. Okay. There's, there's a self consistent calculation by some Russian in the 80s. Okay, because they did that now in DC. We should talk about that because in the in the literature of the helium world, they're all everyone's like it's got to have this anomalous dispersion here at the beginning. But maybe we can talk about that. I'm not, not aware of it. But that's that's what's in the literature of the of the in the superfluid case. Okay, so this is the formula that tells you about the, the dissipation in the superfluid um, both three phonon process. G is the Grunheisen parameter, which is telling you about how the material becomes the speed of sound shifts as you change the density. So this is the nonlinearity parameter of this G here. Okay. So um, well, these, these, these so properties are all bulk properties. Bulk. So you assume that there's the surface layer does not have any effect. That's right. Oh, I see. So with the broken symmetry of the surface, no, 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 you no, can no. have. There was another question. I okay. Yeah, this is all bulk. This is all bulk. For instance, the wavelength of of sound in helium is a uh, hundred nanometers at um, uh, at fifty millikelvin. So as you go to higher temperature, it's even shorter. So any sort of real sample that we're working with has the wavelength of the sound is incredibly short. Okay, so the, um, the predicted quality factor that you would have for an acoustic resonator of superfluid helium versus temperature, this is what one would expect here. So you expect t to the fourth as you cool down, 
And by the time you're at 10 millikelvin, you should start to be limited by the helium-3 impurities, which act as a, as a, as a, um, a classical dissipative gas. And so you can get different purities. And so purity of 10 minus 10 here is the brown one. So we expect our fridge gets down to 5 millikelvin. You know, you can start to expect Qs that are really high. Now, metals also have this kind of, uh, of process that's possible. And you can see that there's a speed of sound to the sixth here. So metals should have amazingly low uh, you know, dissipation from this process. And you know, that's true. But the point is, is that as you cool metals down, this, the, the Q becomes, the acoustic Q becomes flat. And it has to do with the model that most people think is, is true, is that it's the quantum tunneling of defects in the metal that keep you from ever observing the uh, three phonon process in metals. It's that the defects are there, and they, there is a finite rate at zero temperature that's quantum tunneling. So you never observe this kind of physics. Yet the data that I'll show you with helium actually follows this, this line here. <clears throat> okay, so amazingly high mechanical Q should be possible. Amazing electrical Q for microwaves should be possible in helium as well. It should be unobservable. So this is like two things that we fought in the past with other devices that this material looks, looks perfect for. If you ask, you know, so if you have different cues for these kind of oscillators at different temperatures, so at 10 millikelvin, you'd expect a number state lifetime of a macroscopic object that's approaching, uh, you know, 100 seconds or something. Right? Okay. Do it. Oh. Number state lifetime. Uh, you mean Fox thing? Yeah. No. Like if um, if I was in some big thermal state and I'm I'm uh, average in. And I want to know the difference at how long would it take to go to n minus one or n plus one, absorbing one quantum from the thermal bath. So this is basically just saying that the thermal bath is emitting at a certain rate, okay. and uh, what's the time per, ter per quantum? Okay. So you know, if I was doing optimal mechanical cooling, I could hopefully <laughs> cool this thing down to low state. How fast are the quanta coming from the thermal bath? Okay. So I should get one quanta, one blip every every hundred seconds or so. Okay. So the first experiments that we're trying to look at this. What we did was we built a niobium resonator. This is a couple inches, and we filled with superfluid. Um, the niobium resonator is a, a, a microwave resonator of, of like you know uh, 10 gigahertz, and it shows a Q of around a third of a billion. So we don't know what we're doing. We just take niobium. We have a machine. Uh, we dip. We come back to the lab. We dip it in acid to etch off 50 microns of the entire resonator. And if you do that, you get a Q of, of nearly you know, a half a billion, essentially. So that turns out to be relatively easy. There's a fill line to fill this thing. And then there's two. There's a microwave in and a microwave out. So here's a picture of Laura's experiment down in the bottom of the fridge. Bottom of the dilution fridge is here. Um, there's, we're hanging the cell off of a copper wire to do the cooling. Um, Microwave in, microwave out, and then there's a little capillary. Can't see the capillary. Oh yeah, there it is. It's coming off there. So we fill it. We fill this huge volume with this tiny, tiny capillary there. Okay. So there's the Q versus temperature of the niobium resonator. It's you know hitting like half of a bit, half a billion. So that's that's relatively straightforward. Um, then you fill it with superfluid. You just start looking for the you, acoustic modes. You know, you pump on the red side of the microwave resonance, and then you we excite, with, we excite the system with a piezo and look for any sideband appearing on the in the cavity. And you can identify the various acoustic modes, and you know they're within uh, you know less than a percent of what you frequency you'd expect for a right cylinder with this speed of sound and stuff. So you know it's no surprise, it's just standard acoustics. And so you can identify all these different modes, and the different modes have different nodal structure, you know, the white rings are where the mechanical acoustic nodes are, where there's no displacement. In our recent experiments, we've tried to put the fill line right at the node there. Okay, so then you can ask about the Q. So this is what we get for a Q here. This is, you know, a five orders of magnitude in Q on this plot, and then cooled from one Kelvin down to 30 millikelvin. And in our best, in our last run, we see this, this, this is actually two data points on top of each other. Um, we get up to around 30 million. Actually, is this one, two, two, three? Yeah, nearly 30 million on the high point here. And um, the different symbols are different runs of the experiment. 
But you can see some features, like for instance, the data is bound by t to the fourth. It's never above that. We're getting within a few factors of what we'd expect for the helium-3 loss. So we're getting close to the point where we need to put in the, in the ultra-pure helium. And um, this high point is equivalent to a temperature that's around, I think it's around 60 millihead. Okay, so the fact that we're still following t to the fourth, the fact that the two higher points on this last run fit nearly the same Q approximately, we suggest that if we could cool the sample better, we, would, uh, we might get lower, lower, uh, lower dissipation. And so what, one thing we've done over the last couple of months is to engineer a low temperature valve. And so this is a valve, a hydraulic valve, that works with superfluid helium as the hydraulic fluid, and it closes the fill line, and so that we can limit the acoustic loss heading up the line, and also limit the heat loss up, the, up that line as well. The superfluid is really good for transporting heat, that's why we use a tiny capillary. Anyway, so, so we, we're optimistic that we're going to uh, keep being able to improve uh, the Q that we see here. And who knows where it'll, where it'll bottom out. Okay, so, oh yeah, this is a breakdown of our highest Q. Just showing the exponential, exponential breakdown. Is there any easy reason to see why uh, Q is dependent on which mode, like the six? Yeah, we don't understand that yet. It's it. We believe it has to do, you know, the, how. So if the fluid is supposed to be that good, then where's the dissipation? The dissipation is mechanisms are how you hold such a contain, how you hold such a thing. Um, the uh, acoustic loss up the fill line. Um, those are the most likely candidates. Like for instance, well, the the container itself is part of the acoustic resonator. Its first acoustic mode is is something like 15 kilohertz. So that was the whole point of why the superfluid advantage is to have a low speed of sound, is meaning its sound spectrum is very low in frequency. And so we're not in, in, the, in the forest of modes of all the acoustic of the, of the container. But your modes that are do the best are the ones that are closest to 15 kilohertz. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it might be close to it, but the, um, yeah, it, we don't understand all the dissipation mechanisms. That's, that's the bottom line. But the, the point was is that we, we, when we do look at modes at higher frequencies than 15 kilohertz, the Q just collapses. It's really poor, poor above there. So we, do, we, we have, have improved that. But that was kind of the thought that why superfluid could be an interesting thing. Okay, so then you might want to ask, well, what can you do with this? So this is all great, but what are we going to do? So this plot here shows, and I'll, I'll wrap up in just a minute or two, right? So, right, yeah. so uh, this plot here shows what we'd expect for the mechanical occupation of the acoustic mode versus the pump power into the device. This is the standard kind of optomechanical red side band cooling. And the, the ultimate issue with this experiment is looking, you need, no, not only need an amazing mechanical material, you also need an amazing microwave source to do this. And so here's the, if I started the superfluid at five millikelvin, and I had a source this good, which now we think we do have a source that good, we've actually made one from a microwave, a whisper gallery mode resonator, that we should expect to cool down to a few hundred quanta. And then eventually as you keep turning up the microwave source, the phase noise of the source starts exciting the mechanics. So you need a better source, and so you can take this source and then filter it on the dilution fridge through a superconducting cavity. <coughs> it's, hard, it's a hard experiment to do, but let's say you were motivated to do that. If you can filter this another 30 dB just through a superconducting cavity, then you can start to get occupations less than, less than 10 here. And then if you do an amazing job with that, it's possible to hit these kinds of numbers with a really high Q, Q of a billion, tunable, superconducting resonator. You can hit this kind of number. And then the ground state really appears possible for a mechanical thing. So one thing that people say, they're like, yeah, the single photon coupling, well, how big is that in this case? It's actually 10 to the minus 8 hertz. So the single photon coupling is extremely small. The dielectric constant of helium is small. But the thing that you might not be aware of is that the, you can put 10 to the 23 photons into a superconducting cavity of this type and still have Q of 10 to the 11. That's what the people at Cornell and the high energy experiments do in the, in, uh, realize in the laboratory. So the single photon coupling is small, but the actual total coupling, when you include that, the factor of how hard you're pumping, can be incredibly high. And so this is where the dielectric loss in the helium is a really relevant number. And so we, we, as we said, it should, as I said, it should be unobservable. 
<clears throat> so it's a really different frame of parameters than, than most of the community has been thinking about. The, if you have a superfluid resonator like that, and you ask, well, what's its sensitivity to inertial forces? So you can model the superfluid as a mass spring system, where the, the mass of the fluid inside the container is essentially m, and then I'll put the right spring constant to get the right acoustic mode here. And if I assume that I have thermal motion at 10 milliK, Q of 10 to the 10, then the um, thermal motion of the mechanics should be 10 to the minus 16 meters. Okay, so that's the equivalent thermal motion of this slug of, of macroscopic slug of helium in that first acoustic mode. Now, if I take a container and I have a mass spring system in it and I shake it, if I'm shaking it on resonance, then the internal spring has a huge, um, will have a, a large amplitude. I can just imagine that dynamics. I'm shaking something and something big is moving inside. It actually moves Q times more than what you're shaking. So if I shake the container on the outside, the internal motion is Q times higher. So if you flip this around, if you say that my thermal motion is 10 to minus 16 meters, what's my sensitivity to shaking on the outside? It's Q times lower, 10 to minus 26 meters. And that's a surprisingly small number. And the, uh, the strain, if you think about it as a strain field going by, is 10 to the minus 25 in strain. So you start to get into the realm where you're like, wow, this is kind of gravity wave-ish kinds of numbers. Okay. And um, if you think about the acceleration sensitivity at that red one frequency, you're at 10 to the minus 18 Gs. So over the summer, I've gone through more uh, precise calculations of <coughs> strain sensitivity. Going back into the old literature of gravity waves, and figuring out the quadrupole moment of the of the superfluid, how it couples to a strain field. You know, here's the strain field from a gravity wave. This is the quadrupole moments here, and then how much energy gets deposited into the superfluid resonator. And these are the strains that I come up with for different cues of the. So here we are, nearly at 50 million. And if I average for a day, I would be at 10 to the minus 4, 24 in strain. And if you let me average for a year, I'd be 10 to the minus 25. Um, if I can get to really high cues, then I start seeing numbers of 10 to minus 26. Okay. Now, people in the LIGO group have measured uh, for nearly a year. And so, so this is at the frequency of that? Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's, one a narrow, it's, narrow band. Band. it's narrow band, but it's not as narrow as you might think. If it's Q of 10 to the 10, um, you can red sideband broaden this thing. So one should we, you know, if we were doing our cooling experiments, if we can realize a, a low enough microwave source, phase noise source that you can red side and cool, then you're starting to talk about uh, line widths that are in minutes as opposed to years. Right? So if you can really side band cool, resolve cool this thing, you also are broadening it. And if you do that correctly, with, you're not affecting the force noise. Right? That's the whole point of, of the red side band cooling. You don't affect the, the force noise. So the, the measurement time issue, I think it should, you know, in practice we imagine that if we could do something like this, we'd be chopping up the data in blocks of, of an hour or something like that, piecing those together. You wouldn't have to average for a year just watching the thing, not, not touching it. So this is data from the LIGO and Virgo, where they uh, have averaged for months, and uh, they're down at strain, after all that averaging, down to below 10 to minus 25 and 10 to minus 26. And the triangles are the the spin down rate limit for pulsars, meaning if I had a pulsar, and I know its frequency really precisely, and I know how far away it is, if, if I'm measuring it, if I can, I can see this, the, the pulsar actually spin down, since I know how much kinetic energy is in that pulsar, because you know, you know the mass of this thing approximately, then I, I know how much energy is being dissipated from this spinning object. Suppose all that energy were due to gravitational waves. How, and then if that's the case, how big would the strain field be at Earth? That's these triangles. So these are the maximum possible gravity wave amplitudes at Earth from different pulsars. Okay. And the point is, is that what's so great about this experiment is for the first time, sensitivity has dropped below the spin-down rate. So you know, if, if really the spin-down rate was from gravity waves, they should, they should see it. Most people think that the power emitted is from other electromagnetic effects like magnetic field. So and nobody really knows the ratio of how much power you know, it's going to come out in the gravity waves. But this is crossing this boundary. And this superfluid system, just for a kilogram size object, this, this size is what I'm thinking of, it starts to hit into these numbers here. And that really surprised me. You so know, what, what would be the frequencies that you would hit? 
Uh, with a with a yeah. kilogram object. Yeah, kilohertz. It's kilohertz. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's in this range. Okay. And so one could imagine, you know, bigger objects, maybe some higher order modes, different funny shapes to optimize for that. But you know, what's what's really interesting is that this is kind of a rediscovery of, of you know, it's not discovery. It's a re a realization that. Um, Resonant mass detectors also have exquisite sensitivity possibilities. Not just system looks like it's a reasonable choice for such a thing. Okay, so I don't, you know, is this the thing we should do with this? I don't know. Um, I, I don't care about stuff like that. I, I don't believe that you find something interesting. The, the, there's some interesting parameters here, and then as you tell people about it, people, smart people, come up with good ideas. And this is this is just one idea to show that there's incredible sensitivity here. Marcus and the, the folks at Vienna have another amazing idea, and this is the last thing I'll say and I'll, I'll stop, is that if quantum gravity is, uh, is theories of quantum, various theories of quantum gravity, and tell me if I'm phrasing this wrong or right here, but various theories of quantum gravity all predict that there's a minimum length scale that has no physical meaning below that, and that's this Planck length, 10 to the minus 35 meters, it's in most, most theories. And the point is, is that if there is a minimum length scale, that will affect the motion, excuse me, quantized motion of mechanical systems. You're gonna, it, it ends up perturbing the commutator of X and P. And so in an optomechanical system, can you design an experiment to look for those uh, perturbations in, in, uh, in the commutator? And the really interesting experiment from Marcus and, and, and Igor and others was that it looks like there's a parameter range where you should be able to, to really get down to that limit. So another really interesting realization of that paper that's blown my mind is that LIGO, LHC, and some other experiments, all when you ask questions about what kinds of physics at the smallest length scales that they're actually probing, everybody is around 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 19 meters. And you would not think that, I would have thought that if I wanted to go to the smallest <coughs> length scales, I would go to a particle physics experiment. Okay. But if there's other, another route, which is cold, massive objects might have something to say, and might actually be a better probe to probe even smaller length scales. And that's the really cool realization there, is that this community, our community, looking at big massive objects and doing, quant doing motion detection at that limit, might have a lot to say about the smallest length scales that I would have thought just over beers, I would be like, yeah, I talk to the LHC guys, that's where you're gonna probe that physics. That's not necessarily true. So anyway, that's, that's uh, the second thing that I would like to try to do with this mechanical resonator is can we, can we make some uh, push on the parameters of looking for fundamental length scales. So that's pretty much it. That's, uh, that's our superfluid stuff. Um, I don't have a conclusion slide. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's more or less it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. There's Marcus. I have two questions related to this one, so to, to, to this last point. Um, the, the first is, if you have this um, amazing sensitivity and uh, the, 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 this due to the large Q, um, what about um, vibration isolation? Yeah. So is that something um, that you would also have to, have to improve by the fact of Q compared to... Uh. Right. Yeah, you would have to you would have to be isolated from the environment, just like any other sensitive experiment. And um, but like I said, if you read sideband cool uh, broadness thing, like if you go to the cooling estimates, um, you can make the Q of this thing much much lower, right? So you know if we were if we were at the occupation factor at let's say 10 millikelvin is let's say it's close to 10 to the five. And so if we cool it down to the ground state, that would mean that we broadened by 10 to the five. And so the, you're not dealing with a Q of a billion resonator, you're dealing with Q of uh, 10 to the 4. Mm -hmm. right? okay. So it's actual, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's not as a high Q oscillator as you think. Mm -hmm. But still, if you're looking for small strength fields, then you're going to have to isolate to that level. But you know, LIGO does that. Mm -hmm. There's technology. People know how to do that. Yeah, but your Q is higher, that's what I'm wondering, whether then you need even improve. Is it higher? They have a free mass. Uh, I'm not sure that it's, they have a free mass that's isolated where they can see strains of, you know, uh, or displacements of 10 minus 18 meters. And that's a typical distance that we're measuring as well. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's the uncertainty principle for such things around 10 minus mm -hmm. 18 meters. Okay. So I'm not sure that it's, it's different. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Okay. 
Uh, second question. Um, when we, got, we, we had this Washington meeting some time ago, this OSD yeah. meeting, where you presented, actually the, the, you, you, uh, you didn't have data back then, but the, the, the way towards it, yeah. and exactly that question came up, so you did the estimate <coughs> on, the, on the force sensitivity, and then a question came up whether it would be um, possible to measure gravitational waves. Yeah. Your response back then was, um, no, yeah. we did some estimates, it's not possible. So you what's an argument for that, so yeah. what changed? Yeah, so what changed was realizing that there's, there's, if you go look at the gravitational wave books, the, there's impulsive gravity waves, which is from, let's say, a dramatic event of coalescent mm. of two mm. neutron mm. stars, single shot, mm. one millisecond spike right. coming right. by. And the amount of deposited energy into your detector is proportional to mass. And so the bigger the mass of the object, then you, so that's why the Weber bars were made a ton. Mm. Why did they go to the effort for a ton rather than a hand sized thing? It's like they wanted to see the impulsive events. But there's these other sources that are CW sources. So they just sit there stationary, and it's not really true, they're not really stationary. As the Earth moves around the Sun, mm. there's frequency pulling up the Doppler shift of this thing, so you have to track this. This is why broad, red sideband broadening is so important, because then you can keep it within, mm. keep the thing. But there's other CW sources. So that's why I focused here on just a, okay. on just a pulsar and, uh, and that. The integration pattern. Yeah, okay. yeah. This is a great thing. I mean, there's, there's these spinning tops out there. Mm. They're not that far away, you know? It's really... It's really interesting. More questions? Yeah. Well, for that, you have to wear a few of the cathodes to, to the photon in, in superfluid. Oh, yeah. So Sorry, I missed. I didn't say that. It's through the simplest possible thing. The superfluid acoustic wave changes the density. And the density change, then the number of atoms per unit volume changes, so the, the dielectric constant changes. So it's just through the dielectric constant. So the because the acoustic wave is a change in density. And then the, the change in density from the acoustic wave isn't doesn't match exactly the profile of the electric field. So there is a net change in the di overall dielectric, overall frequency of the cavity gets pulled. So it's just through the dielectric. Yeah. Uh, anybody understand why the left side line broadening doesn't lower your I mean doesn't lower your Oh yeah, so you, you, as you pump harder and harder with a microwave pump, you get more and more up-converted signal, because gamma optical increases. So I get more power to measure. But that exactly compensates the broadening and the lower response of the mechanical device to a force. So I get more signal and noise, but I get a, less per, a lower performance mechanical system, and those two effects exactly cancel. Can I view that sensitivity that you get from your devices in this way, the same way as you can. I always do the advantage, for example, for you know, atomic physics experiments looking very, very high energy, just like the EDM experiments, yeah. something like that. But there you look for a detuning, and the detuning is only polynomial suppressed uh -huh. the signal. Whereas if you look for an, in an accelerator, you look at something when you detach it, and, and that's an exponential suppressed by the boson factor. Uh -huh. right. so, so, so in that sense, if you look at for something that is, that is like a where, where you're sensitive on the tuning, it, it doesn't matter how you know how you far it, how far away you are. It's only the sensitivity. That's right, right, right. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's probably how I see that. That's interesting. Why you can see effects of those guys if they can't produce, don't have an energy producing particle, it doesn't produce. Yeah, or, or, or they produce it with an extremely small right. probability. Right. Whereas if you look at them, like an EDM, or you look at an energy shift or something like that. Yeah. You look at something which is which is like the tuning. Yeah, and in, in the end, the the, the the experiment that Marcus and company propose is a phase shift yeah, of so this you know, you translate around this thing. So you're looking for a subtle shift in this. Yeah, it's a very yeah. end of experiment in a sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I just love the idea that you can, you can probe such small length scales with a cold big thing. Yeah, well, and that's something we can do in a laboratory and small it's much scale. Cheaper than yes, cheaper. <laughs> cheaper. Yeah. Everything is cheaper than that, actually. Yes. <laughs> Keith, Keith discount physics. But you know, you know, I want to have one percent of the PR budget. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can so, <laughs> and which which budget? The oh, PR. Oh, yeah. The PR budget. Yeah. yeah. More questions? Well, you know, Professor Schwab will be here until tomorrow evening. Yeah, tomorrow evening. So yeah. don't forget to pick his brains, okay? That's really worth it. No, this is everything I know. There's no more. <laughs> 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 the depth is there. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again. Yeah, thanks. Again.